thank you, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> So um, at NASA's Johnson Space Center, we're just so super proud to be able to continue the legacy of doing spacewalks, as Bob mentioned, uh, from Apollo Heritage, using our suits for science operations. Uh, assembly of the International Space Station. Uh, and uh, operations and maintenance that's ongoing. And now we're looking forward for our return to the moon and using our suits for doing science operations on the lunar surface. Uh, at Johnson Space Center, we have been working doing technology development uh, in-house with our engineers and our operators on uh, design for an exploration suit. We have provided all of that technology, all of the drawings, all of the data, all of the test results for the community. And Axiom Space will be one of the companies that is going to take that and make us new suits. We have not had a new suit since the suits that we designed for the space shuttle. And those suits are currently in use on the space station. So 40 years, we've been using the same suit based on that technology. And now today, Axiom is going to innovate. They're going to take what NASA has provided in, uh, from the testing that we've done, and they will now take and come up with uh, more functionality, uh, more performance, more capability, and we're very excited about what's going to be happening. Uh, at NASA Johnson Space Center, we are proud to partner. We will be working uh, together. We will provide our expertise. We're going to provide all of our facilities, and we will be working together to make sure that we have a safe suit that performs and does everything that our astronauts need for doing surface operations. So we're looking forward to the things that Axiom is doing, and I want to thank the Axiom team. I want to thank the NASA and um, all of our teams that work together to make this happen. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Hi, good morning. Uh, glad to be here and to see you guys today. I am truly honored to be uh, the manager of what Vanessa mentioned is the EVA and Human Surface Mobility Program here at Johnson Space Center that for short means spacesuits and rovers. Um, the spacesuits are the first part of our program that is becoming real. We've been working really hard for a few years to get everything on contract. Um, but once that is in place and we actually have contractors selected, it's really excited to see their work coming to fruition and seeing real hardware. Um, so this contract is a little bit different. It's similar to what we have used for commercial cargo and commercial crew, where we call it a service contract. So historically, NASA has actually owned the spacesuits. Think of it like owning your car. The way we have contracted on what we call the extra vehicular activity services contract is we actually buy services from the vendor. So think of it more like a rental car. So Axiom will be providing the hardware for both training and for flight. They will bring that hardware in and we, NASA, will utilize it and operate it on the surface of the moon um, for our moonwalking. So NASA will actually be in the role still of um, mission control and making the um, mission authority, mission execution decisions, but Axiom's gonna be right there with us um, making sure that suit is, is safe as we have our astronauts walking on the surface of the moon. So this suit, uh, we have a lot of tough requirements on it, so these guys have their work cut out for them. Um, the moon is definitely a hostile place, and the South Pole is going to really be a challenge. So a lot of um, thermal requirements. Um, we are really looking for improved mobility um, so that our astronauts can operate more efficiently and effectively than they were able to do many years ago in Apollo. Um, and then, of course, we have really stringent safety requirements, as Vanessa mentioned, on the suits as well. So um, they certainly have their cut work cut out for them, but we are absolutely confident um, that they are going to be successful. Uh, so our role as NASA is, as Vanessa said, to make sure that all of our expertise and our data and our facilities are made available to them. And um, then we will be in there um, hand in hand with them, helping make sure that they are successful, bringing all of our knowledge to the table, 
um, all of our experience, um, along with our, our friends from the crew office, um, just providing them our expertise and advice and guidance as they go forward. So super excited to have Mark and Russell and their team um, and really looking forward to a few years from now when we see that first Axiom boot print on the moon. All right, we keep forgetting to introduce, so I think I'm going to pass it on to Mr. Mike Seferdini. All right. Thank you, uh, Laura and Bob and Vanessa, too, for being here. This is a big deal for us. Um, let me start by saying, uh, Mark, when I look at here, this sea of new astronauts, I think we're going to need some more suits. <laughs> <laughs> but first, let me... Let me tell you how pleased we are as a company. It's a, it's a huge deal to be selected to provide the, the lunar surface suit uh, for NASA's Artemis program. It's, a, it's an international program. We're not just taking the nation to the moon and beyond. We're taking, the, 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 we're taking civilization to the moon and beyond. And so we're pleased that humanity's next steps on the moon are gonna be in an Axiom space suit. And we're very excited to be a part of this, uh, the exploration mission as it goes forward. Um, the other thing I need to say is, uh, and they've, they've touched on a little bit here this morning, but this is not something that you do by yourself. This is a partnership. It's a partnership with NASA. Uh, the design that we chose and brought forward is a uh, evolvable design from the orbit suit to the lunar surface suit. It's based on about 10 years worth of work that, that's been going on at NASA Johnson Space Center by suit experts. Um, and we're, we're happy to have all of that expertise uh, and that work done. I think, I think when it's all said and done, about 50% of the suit will be based on uh, the original design done by NASA and probably the other 50% will be the work uh, that this team sitting in the auditorium will do. So that's first and very, very important. And as Laura said, this is a critical system. It's like, uh, you know, we all get nervous on launch day. Well, when you do an EVA, it's, it's, uh, it's a significant challenge. And so it's very important that you have very strict uh, safety guidelines and a suit that will uh, provide the redundancy and the reliability you need to make sure every time a human steps foot on the moon uh, that they'll be able to do what they need to safely and get back uh, and be ready for the next, uh, the next mission. So for a second, though, I want to I take a moment to acknowledge the Axiom team, which is, as far as I can tell, nobody's working on suit today because they're all here. <laughs> But could you guys stand up and be recognized? This is the Axiom Space Team. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Um, and, and when I say Axiom Team, it's not just Axiom Space, KBR, Paragon, David Clark, uh, let's see, APT Research, Sofic, uh, and Aerosciences and Technology. Did I get them all? Airlock. And Airlock, oh goodness gracious, Airlock. The, uh, I, did I mention, didn't mention Paragon? I got, uh, left out IM2? All right, sorry about that. Paragon, Intuitive Machines, and Airlock. Um, anyway, my point is, we're a big team. We're, we brought a lot of expertise from around the country to work together to build this suit. Um, and it's a critical part of exploration. Uh, and we're, we're extremely excited and proud to have been selected to, uh, to go on this journey with, uh, with NASA as it takes uh, civilization beyond, beyond low Earth orbit. So with that, uh, I think my job is to hand it off to Mark. We've been sitting here talking about all this stuff, but we have an exciting thing to show you, so uh, Mark will get us started down the road. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, so a lot of hard work has, has been completed for the team to be here today with the spacesuit. Um, for the last couple of years, our team has been off really focused on, on three things, people, processes, uh, and facilities and equipment. Um, our, our team is comprised of many, many people from the NASA XEMU program, so they bring a lot of expertise forward. Uh, a lot of our team has worked multiple EVA programs. Uh, and then we leveraged industry, automotive, um, <clears throat> oil and gas, the theater arts and, and even um, um, design, uh, design from some of the, the uh, I'm sorry, I lost my words. Uh, <coughs> uh, no, our, sorry. <coughs> professional, 
clothing design. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so our, our, we have a vast base of, of really talented and experienced people. Um, our processes, uh, you combine all that with Axiom's agile development process and the team's able to move extremely fast. Um, but, but in a very, very, um, in a very, uh, in a very controlled environment, which is critical to, to building and designing spaceflight hardware. Um, you couple that with using NASA's XEMU technologies and, and it just makes the team's performance even greater for, for success. Uh, Axiom has a number of facilities. Uh, the, the most recent facility we're about to, we have just populated or, or moved into is the EVA program facility. So the team is very excited about that. We vertically integra integrated all the team members and Axiom under one roof. And <clears throat> we're about to open our state-of-the-art labs. We've been working in temporary space, space which, which has been very accommodating. Um, but we'll have everything we need to design, manufacture spacesuits for the lunar surface and for Axiom's uh, space station. And with that, I just want to thank the EVA team on behalf of Russell and I. Thank you so much for, for all of your hard work. Uh, we thank your families for standing, standing by as, as, as the teams work long hours sometimes. And we'd also like to thank uh, Laura, Chris, Jesse, Ben. Uh, we appreciate all the collaboration with you and your team. Uh, the insight and collaboration has been, has gone exceptionally well and, and you guys are a big part of our success as well. Thank you. I I think we're going to a video now. specialists to engineers, managers, you have a range of skill sets and everyone is so proud to be doing what they're doing. It's like a little bit of each of us is going up there with the astronauts and a little bit of our mentors, a little bit of our family, like it's, it's more than just ourselves, right? It's everyone before us and everyone after us. So that's, um, you can definitely feel it. That gives you goosebumps, right? Like, that is, and it hasn't sunk in yet, and I don't know if it will ever sink in. Even when it's happening and you're looking at the moon and you're like, there's someone on the moon in an Axiom suit, like, that is the dream. Space is changing so fast right now, and it's going to be such a great time to want to get into any aspect of the space program, whether, you know, as an engineer, a designer, an astronaut, somebody, you know, stepping foot on another planet. And now the moment you've all been waiting for. Good morning. Uh, 
My name is Russell Ralston. I'm the Deputy Program Manager of UVA at Action Space. In the suit here this morning is Jim Stein. Uh, Jim is uh, an extraordinary engineer. He's a chief engineer on uh, our team. So we gave him the honors. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. We, we gave Jim the honors of demonstrating the suit this morning. I'm going to give him this, uh, this little walking staff here. Um, we are in Earth gravity. We're not on the moon, if anybody doesn't know. Um, on the moon, the gravity is about one-sixth of what it is here. So just in case Jim loses his balance, for safety reasons, we want him to have that. But So I'm going to talk through the suit design uh, just very briefly. And as I do that, uh, Jim's going to perform some different um, actions, mobility, to, to demonstrate the mobility of the suit. Uh, before, we, before we get into that, though, I want to talk about this cover layer. So the cover layer that you see, the, the black, the orange, the blue, uh, personally, I think this looks amazing. Uh, I want to thank Esther Marquise for helping us design this. Esther is um, a designer, a spacesuit designer on the show For All Mankind, if anyone has seen that on Apple TV+. Plus. Um, so, so this suit has a lot of that worked into this. Um, one of the differences between this suit and the suit that will be on the moon is that it will, the moon suit will mostly be white. So we'll replace all the black with white. And that's really for thermal reasons, so didn't want anybody to, to get that mixed up. Um, but other than that, I think this is just a fantastic, fantastic looking suit. So let me, let me go top to bottom here um, and just describe the suit overall. So we'll start with the light band. I think you guys saw the lights as Jim walked out on stage. Uh, on, the light band is mounted to the visor assembly and to the helmet bubble. Uh, and this, this essentially gives the astronauts lights to see where they're in shaded portions of the moon or if they're in low Earth orbit in a night pass, they can turn on these lights to see um, using tools or translating on the space station or anything like that. We also have on the side here, we have a HD video camera. So those of us back on Spaceship Earth watching the EVA, uh, we'll be able to watch it in high definition, which will be a fantastic upgrade, I think, from, <clears throat> from current day technology. All of this is mounted on the helmet bubble. Um, which is amounted to what we call, in this configuration of our suit, the hard upper torso. So the hard upper torso goes roughly from Jim's waist up to the top. And uh, this is kind of the core structure of the suit. It's what we attach everything to. Um, so the arms, I'll talk about the backpack in a minute. So yeah, if Jim wants to demonstrate some of the arm mobility here, um, this really just provides us, again, some structure to mount things to. Each of the arms have a variety of uh, mobility joints and elements that we've designed uh, at Axiom, uh, including the gloves. The gloves are a critical um, part of the suit design, especially for microgravity EVAs where you're using them for hours at a time to translate, to operate tools, to you know, fix things to the suit and so on. So we put a ton of effort into those gloves, pretty, pretty proud of where they're at and are confident those are gonna perform uh, very well. If Jim turns to the side here, um, some people may be wondering, hey, how do you even get in this suit? Uh, there's a hatch on the back, actually. You can see two hinges here. So this suit's a little bit different than the suits of uh, kind of today that's used on the space station. So this is called a rear entry design or a back entry design. This hatch would open up. Um, you would put your feet in, put your arms in, and then kind of shimmy down into the suit. And then we would close the hatch. Um, mounted to the hatch is this box, affectionately known as the backpack. Uh, we call it the, the portable life support system. So inside of this box are all the parts and the components to keep, to kind of keep you alive while you're doing EVA. You can think of it as like a very fancy scuba tank and air conditioner kind of combined into one. Um, so on the lower torso, so let's start kind of from the waist going down to the, to the boots. Um, I'll let Jim do some squats and lunges and, and, and just show off some of the uh, some of the mobility uh, that the suit has and demonstrate some different movements. There's a variety of joints that we've put <clears throat> as well into the lower torso assembly. And this is going to be a huge improvement over the Apollo suits. The Apollo suits didn't have many of these types of joints that we've put in this suit. So the astronauts will be more comfortable, have an easier time walking, performing tasks, um, getting down to like to pick up a rock or something like that or use a geology tool. Um, and then the other thing that, uh, yeah, that's a great, great demonstration there by Jim. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to touch on is the boots. The boots are critical, uh, critical part of the suit, especially for the, the Artemis three mission and missions to the, the, the South Pole of the moon. Um, we'll be entering regions called permanently shadowed regions. These are regions of the moon that never see sunlight and they're very, very cold. And so it's very important that we insulate the boots uh, appropriately to keep the astronauts feet um, uh, comfortable during the EVA. That's a portion of the design. There's, there's, um, as, as Mr. Suffragini mentioned, there's many portions of this design that we've that we've kind of adopted from XEMU and are continuing to refine. That's a, that's an excellent portion. The, the XEMU team did a tremendous job, and a lot of our teammates did a tremendous job designing those boots. So we're taking those forward and refining them to flight. Um, those are a, a really a key aspect of the suit. Um, 
I think I've covered everything pretty quickly here at a high level. I don't think I've missed anything here. Um, so I know we've got some questions and answers that we want to go to, but before we do that, I'd love to introduce um, our Director of Human Space Flight and the upcoming commander of AX2 mission to the International Space Station, Peggy Whitson. Peggy has spent a lot of time in spacesuits, so hey. I'm so excited to be here today. This is, this is a great um, example of what innovation can do. It's, this is going to be such a much more flexible suit and the range of motion is really going to improve the astronauts ability to do all those tasks that they're going to do while they're out exploring on the lunar surface and eventually on Mars. That would be so special. And we are here today actually because of this young group of people here that are here for the Moon to Mars Festival. We think that it's really important that we get you guys started on your spaceflight training. And uh, it's, it's really important because we know that you're going to be our future and you're going to be able to wear this suit someday. So we're very much looking forward to that. And we actually have some really little special guests that are going to ask some questions. And I have somebody I'd like to introduce who's going to help us out with that. And this is my pilot, John Schaffner. We're flying. <laughs> We're flying on the Axiom 2 mission that's going to the International Space Station in a few months. And um, John is here to help me out and get some young people up here to, to chat with you and ask a few questions about this suit. Here we go. Well, I had the extreme pleasure of um, talking to myself in the past. I, was, I had a, an astronaut in me since I was 10. It took me a while, but because of today, the, worst been, the, the wait has been worth it uh, to talk to some people today. First, I'd like to thank NASA and Axiom for making all of this possible in the private and commercial spaceflight endeavor. I think uh, it's a great step, and we're going to introduce some kids to you that I think will be your future, both for Axiom, Artemis, and NASA. So uh, <coughs> I'd like to bring these young people down here that have uh, brought us some really fabulous questions. By the way, thank you, Peggy. I look yeah. forward to our flight. I do too. Very good. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Looking good. Come on over here, son. <laughs> you know, this is great for me. This is actually my demographic, so <laughs> I, I, I feel right at home. All right. Awesome. So what do you think? That's quite a suit, right? Pretty neat, huh? <laughs> Good. Now, I understand you guys have some questions. Uh, Remington, you're eight years old. You've been thinking about space for how long? Uh, about a year. Okay. So what is your question today? Do you wear your space suit in space? Oh, the, your, your, is that a question for me? I'll take it. Uh, well, I won't actually wear this suit. I might sneak back tonight and slip it on. We'll see what happens. But uh, I think this suit will look great on you. So I'm looking forward to one day seeing you in space in this very suit. Would you like that? <laughs> cool. <laughs> Good morning. You're Ian, right? Okay. How old are you? Um, I'm five. That's awesome. So you have a question for Russell, and Russell's right back right. here behind us. What is your question for Russell? Um, what's your favorite part about your spacesuit? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, if you're if you're gonna walk on the moon, I think you have to do it in some pretty cool shoes. So probably the boots. I think the boots are probably my my favorite part. <laughs> he likes the boots. I like your shoes, by the way, today. Thank you for your question, Ian. You look good in this suit also. Hi, Charlotte. I met you a minute ago up there. You, you had a lot more to say then. <laughs> what? <laughs> so you have a question. I think it's for Peggy, right? You want me to help you? Yeah, you know, I know she, she makes me nervous too. <laughs> she's, she's my commander. And she's a very famous astronaut, and it's okay. She has answers for everything. I've tried. 
So I think your question is, how far away is the Earth from Mars? Is that what you'd like to know? Um, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? Okay. That's I okay. I don't either, but Peggy knows. I think it's 120.22 million miles away. That takes a long time to get there. Maybe like almost nine months, but I'd sign up. So. <laughs> How far does your grandmother live away? <laughs> Thank you for your question this morning. <laughs> Viz, good morning, sir. 10 years old. You're almost going to be 11 though, right? All right. Okay, for Mark. Okay, Mark is right back here, the gentleman that introduced the suit to you. Okay, what is your question? What characteristics about the suit will help other life in space? Microphone. <laughs> what, what characteristics about the suit will help us survive in space? That's a great question, Viz. So, <clears throat> As you probably already know, deep space can be a very harsh environment. Um, <clears throat> so, and there's no oxygen, there's no atmosphere. So when we design our suit, we have to make sure it can keep you warm, it can cool you, there's oxygen for you to breathe, and even food and water. So those are all very important aspects of, of our new spacesuit. All right, you've got it from the top. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Remington, back to you. You had another question. This one, I think, was for Russell. Is that right? I'll take it. Okay. Uh, okay. We're working on it. We're almost there. How long can you live in space? How long can you live in space? That's a that's a great question. Um, so we've had people, or NASA has had people as an agency on this International Space Station for over 20 years. Some of those individuals have, have stayed on, uh, on the space station for over a year at a time, but we don't actually know how long. So we, we need to keep exploring, need to keep uh, building space stations and going back to space to figure out answers to questions just like that. That's long enough for me. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Uh, Jane. Over to you in the pink. Okay, you have a question for Peggy? I have questions for her too, but how about you first? <laughs> what is your question? How many times can you go on a space mission as an astronaut? So I've been, I've been on uh, three different space flights previously. They were long duration missions, and John and I are gonna go on another mission together here shortly in a few months. And so that would be four, uh, but I'm looking forward to any others I can get. <laughs> How many times would you like to go to space? Three. <laughs> okay, we've got you down for that. Got you down for three. Okay. Viz, last question's yours. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. Okay, this is for Bob right behind you, Bob Cabana and Mike Sufferdini, both these two gentlemen here. What is your question? When will we, when will we see the spacesuit on the moon? That is a great question, Vince, and NASA is working very, very hard to ensure that we keep Artemis III on track, and our goal is to have the first woman and next man back on the surface of the moon on Artemis III in 2025 and they'll be wearing an Axiom Lunar Surface Suit. Awesome. How old will you be in 2025? Sorry? In 2025, when the suit is on the moon, uh, when, well, yes, how old will you be? Uh, 23, 11, 12, 13. Okay, 13, awesome. Uh, the Artemis Generation, thank you very much, and we'll see you guys in class. Thanks for coming up, sweetie. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Wow, that is super cool. Isn't that exciting? Let's do another round of applause for everyone. This is so exciting to be part of this. Well, again, I want to express heartfelt thanks to all of our panelists here. Congratulations to NASA and Axiom for this amazing milestone and achievement as we prepare to return humans to the moon in an entirely new architecture and program. And we can't wait for that day when we have the first woman and person of color and other astronauts step on the surface of the moon and really begin a whole new phase of adventure and science and exploration. So with that, that concludes today's program. Thank you for joining us. I now would like to invite members of the media to come to the front for a closer conversation. And we look forward to having all of you join us at the Moon to Mars Festival here at Space Center Houston. Again, it runs through Sunday of this week with live entertainment on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night and Sunday afternoon. Again, thank you for joining us. And here we go. Ten. Hydrogen burnoff igniters initiated. Seven, six, five, four stage engines start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. And here we go. Ten. Hydrogen burnoff igniters initiated. Seven, six. Five, four stage engine start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. Four RS-25 engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. traveling at 1,420 miles per hour. The four core stage engines are back at maximum thrust. The next major milestone will be for the solid rocket boosters to cut off and jettison about two minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, so about 30 seconds from now. Again, quiet here in Mission Control Houston as teams continue monitoring the flight of Artemis 1. We're now 16 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center, traveling over 2,800 miles per hour. Standing by for solid rocket booster jettison and shortly thereafter. confirmation that the solid rocket boosters have separated these 177 foot boosters. Now the core stage continues to power the flight of Orion, all four RS-25 engines firing, traveling over 3,400 miles per hour, 46 miles downrange.
and you're seeing there on your screen our first Earth views. This view of Earth captured from a human-rated spacecraft not seen since 1972 during the final Apollo mission some 50 years ago. The views of our blue marble in the blackness of space now capturing the imagination of a new generation, the Artemis generation. At 6.44 a.m. Central, just about nine minutes and 30 seconds ago, commands were sent for the outbound powered flyby burn to occur with the orbital maneuvering system engine, or OMS engine, on board Orion, which sends Orion close enough to the lunar surface to leverage the moon's gravitational force and swing the spacecraft once around the moon toward entry into distant retrograde orbit. Following this, Orion will remain in the distant retrograde orbit for one half elliptical orbit around the moon, which will last about six days. now to distant retrograde orbit or DRO. We're going to be about 38,000 miles away from the lunar surface as we orbit around. That's part of why we're calling it distant. And we call it retrograde because the moon orbiting the Earth in this direction and then we're entering into our orbit in this direction. Opposites retrograde. Now we're choosing this orbit because it's extremely stable. It doesn't cost a lot of fuel to maintain your position there. And that gives all of our engineers, our flight controllers, the chance to really learn about Orion systems in deep space, learn about flying a spacecraft farther than we've ever sent one intended for humans. We're going beyond anywhere we ever went for Apollo. And so we're in that orbit test out all of those systems. Eventually we'll do a maneuver to break out of that, do another flyby and come home. We're continuing to get some spectacular views from the Orion spacecraft. 
from this view, Orion is 1,277 miles above the lunar surface following its return powered flyby burn, which sent it around the backside of the moon. Orion now has its sights set on home. This view is from one of the solar array wing or saw cameras on board the vehicle. The vehicle now over 1,680 miles away from the moon. And that small sliver towards the bottom of your screen, that's here, that's home, that's us. And that is where Orion is headed next. Fifty years ago today, Apollo 17 Commander Gene Cernan and Lunar Module Pilot Jack Schmidt guided Challenger to a pinpoint landing on a barren rock-strewn area of the moon called Taurus Littrow. A half century later, NASA's newest moon explorer, the Orion spacecraft, is barreling its way back home after circumnavigating the moon and beyond in an elliptical distant retrograde orbit now less than two hours away from splashing down in the Pacific Ocean, west of Baja, California, to complete its shakedown mission that has opened a new era of deep space exploration. Thank you, Philip, and again, uh, a live view of Orion closing in on planet Earth, now about uh, 11,000 miles away from Earth, as it uh, continues a, a very, very precise trajectory. Uh, for a splashdown that is scheduled at 11.39 and 42 seconds a.m. Central Time this morning. Now just one minute away from crew module, service module separation. We'll be standing by for confirmation of that from the uh, 10 seconds until set. We have confirmation of separation. Orion flying on its own. Again, uh, the separation occurred right on time at 11 a.m. and 11 seconds central time with Orion 3,200 statute miles away from Earth. The European service module has done its job. Just one minute away from entry interface. And this view uh, from the uh, cabin camera 
looking uh, out of the upper hatch of Orion, you can see the limb of the Earth. We're going to be losing all of uh, the data here shortly once we uh, enter into the Earth's atmosphere and begin the first of the two blackout periods. Again, uh, this is a uh, visualization of what should be happening with Orion at the moment, although we are in a blackout period that should end about three minutes and 15 seconds from now. And we have data from Orion. Orion out of the blackout period. Flight Dynamics reports that Orion is right on the money, coming right down the pike, a good view out of the uh, cabin camera looking out of the uh, upper hatch of Orion. We should be performing uh, the skip entry maneuver momentarily. Good communications established with Orion. This view on the deck of the USS Portland. And there is a view out of the uh, cabin camera of Orion as it continues a series of roll reversals. We have data back from the spacecraft. Flight Dynamics reports uh, Orion straight and narrow on a true course toward its splashdown site. Forward bay covered jettisoning less than three and a half minutes from now. One hundred fifty thousand feet off the ocean. Orion now traveling at Mach 10. Orion now at 50,000 feet. Forward bay covered jettisoning pyros are armed. Twenty five thousand feet. Droves have been deployed. Two good drogue shoots reported by uh, the recovery team out in the Pacific. The descent rate is right on the money. Orion's uh, velocity now down to 282 miles an hour. Range to splash down one and a half miles. 10,000 feet now. And we're on mains. 5,000 feet. Reefing in progress.
three good main shoots for Orion. We have three fully inflated main shoots. Time to splash down 90 seconds. Perfect descent rate reported. And there it is, high over the Pacific, America's new ticket to ride to the moon and beyond now in view. Orion under its chutes descending towards splashdown. Orion in the perfect orientation for splashdown, just seconds away. One thousand feet. Good descent rate. Five hundred feet. Splash down. From Tranquility Base to Taurus Litro to the tranquil waters of the Pacific, the latest chapter of NASA's journey to the moon comes to a close. Orion back on Earth. Orion is in great shape. Stable one, just in the orientation that had been expected. Please raise your hand so we can make sure we get you the microphone as well. Please give us your name and your outlet to begin with, and then your question. <laughs> uh, Mark Corot with Aviation Week. When do you expect this, uh, this version uh, to be in space? and I presume on the space station, and what would you do at that stage in order to evaluate? Test one, two. Test one, two. Uh, thanks, Mark. So uh, first off, Axiom is building their suit to go to the moon. This is the lunar surface suit, and uh, we hope to have it on the moon in 2025 with Artemis three. On the space station. I'll, yeah, sure, I'll take that. So, so this suit that's designed for the Artemis 3 mission will not be tested on the space station prior to that mission. We will do an extensive set of ground testing and qualification program to make sure that the suit's bulletproof and safe to go on that mission. But no, we won't, we won't take it to the space station first. Our next question, I believe, 
Fox has a question from the floor over at the camera as well. Any additional questions for Bob Cabana as well, we can take those at this time. Meredith, if you want to take the microphone over to our camera over here. We have a question about the sizing. Oh, yes. Um, th the new designing for women in particular, can you talk about what went into that, the differences, um, and um, what that design will be like? Sure, yeah, I can speak to that. So we've put a lot of effort into the sizing of this suit and paying attention to how we design different um, different joints uh, in the suit to accommodate anybody. Um, first percentile female to 99th percentile male. There's kind of two parts to that. There's there's getting the size to where they can perform a range of motion for, for a given task. And then the second part is making sure that when they perform that range of motion, it's done in an easy way. It's not very hard where you're fighting the suit and that type of thing. So we have a variety of test subjects at Axiom that we put in the suit. Um, lots, of, lots of people who have been in the suit for for a long time, tested many different prototype spacesuits. Um, we also put crew members in the suit to test this, and so we'll, we'll, we'll basically take a lot of different test subjects and crew members, put them in the suit, evaluate designs, and, and refine them to make sure that it, the suit performs well for, for any individual who's gonna get, in, get inside the suit. So basically it's gonna be this same suit, custom fit to each person, male or female, is that correct? Uh, that's, that's close, so it's, it's, it's not quite custom fit. We have the capability to do that, but what, we're, what this design does is essentially a, a kind of a macro and a micro sizing. So we have different sizes of elements that we can swap out, a medium, large, and small, if you will, <clears throat> for different components. But then within each of those sizes, we also have an adjustability to where we can really tailor the suit to someone's, you know, the length of their leg or the length of their arm or things like that. So we have a lot of sizing capability to adjust the suit for, for their particular body. And just a little bit more of what you were expressing during the public speaking about the flexibility. You were talking about how he's able to bend up, pick the samples up, and just the improvements from the older. Sure. Um, so I would say that, that both at Axiom and at NASA, there's been a, a tremendous amount of work that's been done in the past to improve the mobility of the suit. A lot of that was done through various prototype suits, um, years ago through the XEMU project, and we're doing the same thing at, at Axiom. And so we mentioned a partnership earlier, you know, we're really working together to, to find the best architecture to, to give the astronauts the best mobility possible for the tasks that they need to perform. Um, and, and so we look at those historical designs and learn from those in the previous testing that's been completing in addition to, you know, trying new ideas out that our team has inside the lab, testing those uh, in our, inside our lab or inside different environments um, or to different facilities, excuse me, um, that NASA has or that we have. And so essentially what you do is you look at what's been done in the past, you learn from that and you try some new ideas and we just kind of iteratively improve the suit over and over and over again, making tweaks here or there as we learn, learn new lessons. Okay. Some instructions for our phones, uh, phone bridge friends as we move the microphone up the stairs for a question up at the top of the stairs. If you're on the phone bridge, Please press star one if you have a question, and after you are done with your questions, you can hit star two to withdraw your hand. We have a question in the room. Sir, your name and your outlet, please. Hi, Robert Perlman with uh, space.com and CollectSpace. Um, two questions somewhat related. Um, the, can you give an example of what was brought over from the XEMU research and what is new um, from the Axiom contribution? And then just in general, in terms of donning and doffing the suit, is it a, can a single individual put it on themselves? Do they need assistance like right now with the EMU? And, um, and, and how is it put on? How, much, how many different parts are there? Sure, yeah, great, great question. Uh, a couple examples of areas where we've kind of directly transferred technology from XEMU. Um, the boots are, are one of those. Um, the hard upper torso of the spacesuit, NASA put a tremendous amount of effort into designing that hard upper torso. Uh, and so we, we looked at that design, we've tweaked a couple minor details, but in large part, that was a direct transfer helmet bubble. But the rest of it, um, soft goods and things like that, we've designed in-house at Axiom, our, our own patterning, our own designs. Um, you know, obviously in collaboration with NASA and talking with NASA, but those are internal components that are, that are a little bit different. The gloves are different. We've, we've changed how the gloves are made and, and the design of those. So that's, that's an Axiom unique um, product. As to how you get in and out of the suit, there's a hatch on the rear of the, the hard upper torso, and that hatch essentially swings open just like, a, just like a door. It has two hinges and it swings open. 
And so you would put your feet into the suit, kind of sit up, sit up on the suit, and put your feet in, put your arms in, and slide, slide down into the suit. So a single person will be able to don the suit. We've, we're currently actually putting some features in to enable that, um, so they can self-close the hatch and then self-index um, themselves inside the suit. You can think things like shoulder straps and that, that type of thing. Um, so we're, we're still working on a couple of those elements, but, but uh, we've made some good progress toward them. Uh, just to follow up, given that, given the use of the hatch, are you envisioning this being used with a suit lock of any sort with the vehicles that are being developed? Sure. So the, the current work that we're doing does not involve a suit lock or a suit port or anything like that. Um, certainly a rear entry design would be what you need to, to, to make that type of idea come to fruition, but, but currently we're not working to that. Another question down here in the front. And then we'll go to our phone line. If you do have a question on our phone bridge, please uh, press star one to indicate you have a question. Uh, this is Mark Corot again with Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, how long will an astronaut be able to function in this suit? And I'm, I'm interested in the sorts of advances that you've tried to make in, in mobility, dexterity, um, communication and also situational awareness um, that the astronauts can can obtain in this suit the objectives um, so I heard a couple questions there can you repeat your first one I'm trying to keep track of <laughs> well let me, uh, let me skip. I think it was how, how long? Did you say how long they can be? Yeah, there? how long okay. can they wear the suit on a mission, given, uh, you know, uh, sort of estimated capability. And then, again, um, I'm talking about the advances you're striving for in terms of uh, mobility, dexterity, um, sure. communication, and also situational awareness. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, so, so the, the first one is pretty, pretty simple. So we're, we're designing the suit for eight hours and a nominal eight hour length. Certainly in the right conditions, um, the suit can go longer than that. Um, but it's, so it's a, it's, it's a step, uh, kind of a step up from the current day space suits. The current day suits were designed at six and a half hours and a, a lower what we call metabolic rate, basically how hard you're working in the suit. So we designed to a higher metabolic rate and eight hours in this suit. So it's, a, it's, a, it's honestly, it's a pretty huge step up in performance in terms of EVA capability. Um, situational awareness is, is, is a good topic to talk. Um, that's critical for astronauts, especially while they're EVA. This is a very um, dangerous operation, of course. So we've, we've incorporated some features, and again, some of these are, are things that have transferred to Mexi and Mu. So if you look at the helmet bubble and the visor assembly, uh, if you were to kind of do a side-by-side -side between that and the current suit, you'll notice that there's much more clear vision in this helmet bubble. The visor assembly has been kind of compacted back to the, the, the rear the, of, the, of the helmet bubble. That's something that XEMU worked towards, and that's something that we're kind of taking forward and refining. And what that does for you is gives you much more situational awareness, much more visibility, especially for low Earth orbit EVAs, where if you're translating and you're kind of looking up, you're not, your view isn't blocked by the visor itself, so you're having to move your head more or move the suit more. So it makes translation in the microgravity environment more, um, more intuitive. Any additional questions in the room? Once again, we're going to go to the phone bridge, uh, star one, to indicate that you have a question. At this time, we don't have any questions on the phone bridge, so I'm going to move on to Fox 26 in the front row. Um, this, this is just a, um, kind of a basic question for the purpose of my, my story for the audience. If, if anyone wants, wants to speak about the partnership between NASA and commercial in general and the benefits of this in a situation such as what we're witnessing sure. today. Yeah, I can take that one. So again, we talked about earlier this morning um, that this is under a service contract. And so Axiom retains ownership of the hardware. Um, and again, we are working in collaboration to develop the suit to make sure that it does meet the NASA requirements. Um, but outside of that, we actually encourage Axiom and any ex EVAS contract vendor to go out and look for other commercial customers um, that can use this suit. Um, and what that does at the end of the day is reduce the cost to the government as we can cost share across other um, customers that they have. And there's a question and behind, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. And, and so I would just add that because Axiom is building a commercial space station, 
Um, <clears throat> we, we also need an EVA capability. So, <clears throat> so it fits really, really well with our, our business model and, and, and we're, we're building suits for both NASA, for Artemis, and then for, for Axiom, for, for EVAs, yes. There's a question behind you. Hi, uh, David Phillip with the Associated Press. Uh, I just want to know what, what's different between the outer layer and the underneath layer? I mean, is it just uh, color and what kind of design differences? Yeah, great, great question. So there's actually a lot of layers to the spacesuit. Um, uh, in general, you have an inner layer that's called the, we call it the bladder layer, and that's what holds the air inside the spacesuit, okay? So that's, it's, you can think of it like a balloon almost. Outside of that is what's called a restraint layer, and that, that layer holds the shape of the balloon so that, so that it holds the air pressure and kind of takes the load of all the, in, the inflating the suit. Then from there you have uh, uh, base, essentially an insulation layer that's actually made up of a bunch of different layers on top of that. So, so that's one of the difference that you won't see on this suit. This suit does have the same bladder layer and restraint layer, but the insulation layer is different. So this is, this is what we would call a cover garment that we use to protect the inner layers of the suit during ground testing or training or things like that. For space flight, we need to protect uh, the astronaut from the thermal environment of space. And so the insulation layer really helps protect against the sun rays and UV light and things like that. So there's a variety of materials that we use inside of that layer to do that job. And then for the Artemis III mission, we're also um, doing some proprietary things to that layer to, mm -hmm. to help with dust, because um, dust mm -hmm. is gonna be a huge problem uh, when we go back to the moon. Excellent, we have nine questions on the phone bridge and we have one more in the room, so I'm gonna go to the phone bridge. I'm gonna start with Alicia Saws uh, from Mashable. We're gonna unmute your line and you may ask your question at this time. I'll take it. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Uh, this is this is probably an area where I might say, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So, um, yeah, we're still using diapers in the spacesuit. They're just honestly a very effective solution. Um, sometimes simplicity is best, and this is one of those this one of those cases. So yes, they the today's suits currently use diapers, and we're envisioning the same for the future. Okay. Moving on to the Houston Business Journal and Jishun. You may go ahead and ask your question. I think the question was, how are we incorporating new technologies from previous research into this suit? That's at least what I heard. Okay, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit and if anybody else wants to jump in. Um, yeah, great question. So <clears throat> there's been a lot of research and development that's gone on um, both in the private industry but also especially inside the government as well through through the XEMU project and then, then projects that preceded it. Uh, so. So at least in terms for Axiom and how we kind of approach suit design, we, we, we look at all of that work that's been done, um, the technology development for, for different components of the suit, um, and then we, we, when we architect this solution, we look at what, what, what makes sense for the type of suit that we're, we're building for, um, given the requirement set that we have. So the requirement set we're working to is slightly different than XEMU, um, so, you, so we expect to see some changes. Um, we also look at data from various payloads that have flown. So NASA's actually done a tremendous amount of work at flying um, payloads like the SURFI payload experiment that, that tested different technologies on the International Space Station. 
um, kind of more at a component level, still still integrated. So we, we look at all of that data and we look at all those technologies and assess where they're at in, the, in terms of maturity. And then we decide we, what makes sense to put into our suit, um, given the, again, the requirements that we're working to, the schedule we have and a variety of other factors. Looks like we're having a little bit of an issue with the audio from the phone bridge making it to NASA TV. So if you give me a moment to restate the question on the microphone before you answer. Our <coughs> next question is going to come from Jim Siegel of nasatech.net. And again, give me a moment to repeat the, the question once it's asked. Go ahead, uh, Jim. Must be a rocky place full of sharp edges. Are there any advancements in tear resistant technology that this suit has over the Apollo era? Sure. Um, so, uh, great, great question. So, yes, you're correct. The moon, the moon, uh, the, the lunar regolith, the rocks, things like that, they are very, very sharp. Um, and so, obviously, when, you, when you're walking around in an inflatable suit, these, these are things you pay attention to. Um, so, uh, I talked a little bit before about the insulation layer of the suit. The, the very outer layer of that suit is comprised of a number of different fabrics, uh, and, and many of those are specifically designed to prevent puncture, uh, tear, you know, they're, they're tear resistant, um, prevent scuffing, and things like that. And to make sure that you know the, the, the fabric selections that we choose and the way we design it on the suit is going to work, we do lots of testing in the house on sometimes at, at an integrated level where we take the suit and test the entire suit. But oftentimes we take sa you know s samples of the fabrics and test those and, and there's a, just a whole suite of different tests that we do to, to look at the durability of a given fabric and the, and the materials in that fabric. Um, and uh, that's, that's one of the major ways you kind of work against the, the risk of getting a puncture or a tear or something like that from, from uh, the lunar surface or any, any other. Um, the same, same thing applies on LEO as well, the low Earth orbit. Great. Our next question comes from Chris Davenport. So the question is, uh, is this the same suit for the EVAs? Why is there a covering on it? Is there proprietary information that you are keeping? Uh, eventually this suit will not have this covering, so why not just show it off now? And if you could, please give us your name and your title. So this is Mark Greeley, the program manager for, <coughs> for Axiom. Uh, so our, our architecture is the same for, for Lunar and for LEO. Uh, there are some things that will obviously be different. Uh, when you go to Lunar, it will have an, a protection garment on the outside. It won't have the, the cover layer that, that we're demonstra demonstrating today. Uh, the boots um, <clears throat> that we have today are very similar. The, the gloves are very similar. Uh, for ISS or our commercial space station, or if we have the opportunity to support NASA space station, uh, we will likely have different boots and and perhaps different gloves. The cover layer may may be uh, very similar, uh, <clears throat> but but the the suit itself is very close. Uh, the the base configuration is very close for for lunar or Leo, and and you you are correct. I mean <clears throat> we we are in competition with 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 uh, Collins, so there are things that, that we are, that, that, that we haven't revealed below the suit, which is uh, uh, proprietary to Axiom. We're going to our next question on the phone line. If you could please tell us your name and your outlet before asking your question.
is how are you mitigating dust? Will you be packing extra when we go to the moon? Uh, and please acknowledge who you are. Sure, so my, I'm, this is Russell Ralston, Deputy uh, EVA Program Manager at Axiom Space. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great question. So yeah, dust is, dust, dust is gonna be a pretty tricky problem to deal with uh, on the lunar surface. So, so we attack it in a couple of different ways and I'll try to give you the best answer I can while you know, still acknowledging we are, we are in competition. Um, so, so when we look at the way we design the suit, um, we, we look at a couple of different ways to tackle dust. One, you know, one approach is to prevent dust from coming onto the suit. So looking at different treatments or things that we can do to the suit to prevent dust from adhering to the suit in the first place. Um, that being said, we know it's going to adhere to certain areas. And so what we, what we do then is we look at how can we keep that dust from then liberating off the suit once it comes back into the lander. Because as long as it stays on the suit, it's fine. Um, you know, it's not a hazard to health or things like that. Um, but what we don't want to happen is, is for, that, for that dust to come off the suit and then get into the air and, and things like that. Um, so that's definitely an integrated problem that will work with the lander providers. Um, but, but as far as the suit goes, we have a couple different techniques um, that we'll go through in terms of cleaning the suit uh, and, then, and then putting some devices on the suit to, to make sure that the dust doesn't come off and liberate into the atmosphere. Um, and then, and then to, your, to the question about, you know, are we gonna fly extra suits or things like that? One of the approaches we look at is, is intentionally making portions of the suit sacrificial. So you'll see this type of idea in racing where, you know, on the helmet visor, they'll have tear offs essentially. So as, as d dirt and dust gets on the helmet visor, they can just tear off a new portion and, and see clearly again. So that taking that same type of idea and applying it to the suit, um, I, I envision we'll have a few things like that. And so of course we will, We'll work with our logistics teams and with NASA to come up with the right sparing strategy for those kinds of components and components that we expect, you know, might not make it the full, the full mission, um, if if there are any, you know, once we get through the through the full analysis. Okay, our next question comes from John from Popular Science. John, are you there? Can we go to John? Well done, John. Okay, next up is Lucy from AFP. And after Lucy will be Alan from Al Jazeera English. Bit about the fabrics, please. Can you hear me? Okay, good. All right, so yeah, this is Russell Ralston, uh, EVDA Deputy Program Manager at Axiom Space. Um, <clears throat> so you're correct, the temperature environment on the lunar surface is, is a pretty extreme environment. You know, it goes from several hundred degrees positive Fahrenheit to, you know, in, a sh in the shade, several hundred degrees negative uh, in, the, in the Fahrenheit range. Um, and so as you walk in between those, those environments on the surface, you're, you're dealing with large temperature swings. Um, and so we, we do have to select, you know, I think you're kinda, your question's correct. We do have to primarily uh, work against the temperature extremes with, with, with material selection. So which fabrics we use, which materials we use on the suit, um, and then how we build up the insulation layer to provide um, most of the, most of the, the resistance to the temperature change. Fortunately, most of that, um, hopefully this isn't too technical, most of that heat transfer is, is radiation, so our insulation is really targeted against radiative transfer, except for the boots, and so earlier I was talking about how it's really important on the boots that we design those in such a way, um, because your feet are kind of constantly in contact with the surface, or if you kneel down and your knees inside your suit touching the surface, um, there's, uh, there's some, some insulating materials that, that we're, we're applying in different areas to help prevent uh, the crew member's skin from becoming too cold or too hot or things like that. So um, it really does come down to material selection and the fabrics that we're using 
uh, on, our, on our suit for the actual insulation layer um, help address that particular concern, both, both for the cold and for the hot. Excellent. Our next question comes from Al Jazeera and Alan. Alan, are you there? So what is revolutionary about this suit uh, and what can we use from the suit design uh, and product that could be used on earth for healthcare workers or first responders or people in cold, cold climates? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, again, Russell Rawls from uh, EVA Deputy Program Manager at Axiom Space. So <clears throat> it's, it's almost, it'd almost be easier to tell you what's not revolutionary because so much has changed, especially if you were to do a side-by-side -side comparison to like the Apollo suits. Um, so some of the changes are in the soft goods side, so if you look at the spacesuit itself, um, the joint designs are all, um, all, all brand new, and, and again, a lot of them were, were, were developed in-house at Axiom. Um, probably, probably the easiest examples to give are some of the components in the live support system, though. Um, there are components, um, one of them I'll call the, the spacesuit water membrane evaporator, that's just the title, the title we give it. This device um, helps us uh, provide cooling to both the avionics inside the suit and, and the crew member themselves. That, that component is, uh, it was in development for, for, gosh, I don't know, almost maybe two decades, uh, something like that. That, that component is, a, is remarkable new technology that, that we're using in our suit. And um, so, th so that's, that's what we mean by revolutionary. It's not, it's not taking, a, um, in many cases, it's not taking a piece from, say, the current spacesuit and just kind of tweaking it and upgrading it. There's, there's cases here or there of that, but in large part, the life support system is, is totally brand new. Um, it leverages lessons learned from previous suits. So, so we're, we, we obviously study what types of failures have been hap happened in the past and what's worked well and what hasn't worked well. But almost everything inside the life support system is totally, totally brand new. And any uses for these revolutionary products that could be used here on Earth? Yeah, uh, great rider, yes. So one of the things we do at Axiom as a commercial company is I'll constantly look at where can we apply these same technologies to, to other industries or to help, uh, you, know, you get the example of healthcare workers or, or other things. Um, so yes, we, we take each of those technologies, a lot of them in the life support system again, and we look at different industries of where, where those could help. And so um, I, think, I think in the coming months and years, you'll see uh, more clear examples of that. Our next question is gonna come from uh, the Discovery Channel, but first I'm gonna go to a question here in the room. Uh, go ahead, and can you tell us who you are and who you fit? <coughs> there we go. Okay, hi, um, Andrea Leinfelder of the Houston Chronicle. I just wanted to follow up a little more on the um, cover versus protection layer, just so when people see these photos, I can explain to them that that exterior is not what's gonna be on the moon. So can you tell me just like what this cover layer is and how a protection layer might be different, if that makes sense? Sure, yeah, so the easiest example is, this is what's on the suit for the ground testing and training, and it protects the bladder layer and the restraint layers of the suit and the joints and things like that. So it's, it's like wearing a jacket. It's just another layer that goes on top that protects you, in, you know, in jacket case, from being cold, and in this case, from scuffs or bends or you know, whatever, whatever else happens while we're testing the suit, bending down on the ground or something like that. So it's, it's pretty simple. It's just a fabric layer that, that, that protects the, the inner layers of the suit. The insulation layer that we've developed is, is much more complex. So it, it has, um, I won't give the exact number, but it has a variety of layers to it with different materials sandwiched and kind of laminated inside of it. And that helps uh, 
with a radiation heat transfer, essentially. So one of the materials that we put in there is called aluminized mylar. Sometimes you'll see this in people's like attics in their homes. You'll have this like metal looking film that gets stapled up on the rafters. Um, and that helps with heat insulation. So we use that in part of that insulation layer. So whereas this is kind of a single fabric just for basic protection purposes on the ground, the insulation layer is pr providing cut, or the, the flight insulation layer is providing cut resistance, puncture resistance, thermal insulation, um, and a variety of other 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 features. So it's it's a much more complex um, part of the suit, and um, well, we kind of tailor that layer to different portions of the suit based on what you know what's on the knee might be a little bit different than what's in the backpack, so to speak, things like that. Our next question comes from the Discovery Channel, and I'm going to go to David on the phone, and then we'll have two more questions on the phone and one more here in the room. So we're going to David on the phone. It always takes a moment. Okay. Uh, Mark Greeley, Axiom EVA Program Manager. So uh, I, I did mention around 50-50, the, the, uh, the pressure garment system, uh, the, the entire soft suit is an Axiom design. <clears throat> the, the gloves are, are an Axiom design. Um, and then there are some other components that, uh, that are beneath the cover layer that, that are really proprietary to Axiom that, that, uh, that, that we've changed based on trade studies. Um, um, <clears throat> in many cases, as we've talked today, we, we, we use NASA's technologies. Uh, and if, if there are areas where the technology wasn't fully mature, we iterate on it and, and, and try to Try, try to bring it to completion in terms of maturity so we can use it on the suit. Okay, and our last question, I believe, from the room. This is also gonna be our last question for today. We're rounding out today's program. This is Robert Perlman with space.com and Collect Space. Thanks. Um, comparing this to what we know from Apollo, um, the Apollo suit was a one piece in itself, but then it was augmented by pockets and um, mounting points for cameras and everything else. And realizing this is not the final version of the outer layer, but how much of that other augmentation do you anticipate for this suit? Um, that, and is it, is it Axiom's responsibility to provide the pockets and the attach points, or will NASA be augmenting the suit for its own needs? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so we'll, we'll provide, I'll answer the last part first. So we'll provide everything, the, the whole suit, EVA tools for the lunar surface and, and, and everything that goes with it. Um, so yeah, we, we do have the, the, the insulation layer design um, with different pockets, um, things that we call kind of multi-purpose attachment points that can be used for crew rescue if needed or, or other things like that, carrying tools and things like, um, um, and, uh, and other devices if they have a payload they need to take out or something like that. So, so you'll see a lot of features when we reveal that, that particular flight outer layer that, that that is included in our part of the design of the suit. So, so we'll have 100% uh, design um, influence on that and obviously working with NASA and, and provide that to them. And one quick follow-up if I can. Similarly with the visor, do you anticipate, um, are we going to see another gold visor like we did on Apollo or are you, because we're going to the South Pole, is uh, clarity more of a priority? Yeah, good question. We'll, we'll still have a, a, a visor that provides UV, UV protection to the eyes. You, you, there's still portions of sunlight on the, on the South Pole, so anytime you're in that, we'll pro probably have that down. Uh, in addition to hard visors, just like in your car, right? So, so if the sun's just bothering your eyes, you can put those visors down and, and block that temporarily if you want to. If there are additional questions, you can always reach out to Axiom Space at media at axiomspace.com. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your wonderful questions and thank you to the entire team and congratulations. Thanks so much.